Hello, it's Denise from Women Beyond a Certain Age. We have such a special guest today. Now, I have to tell you, I'm too grateful that she's here because she says she's not busy, but she's the busiest person I ever know. And I try trying to get her for an hour was like a huge accomplishment for me. <laughs> Let's make it about me. So our guest today is Crescent Dragon Wagon. Now, I've always called Crescent Crescent, though a lot of people just call her Dragon. So I hope that's okay, Crescent. That's how I met you. So that's how I think of you. It's absolutely okay. <laughs> now, let me tell, I have to tell people a funny story about you. And then you have such important information for us today. And I think that it will resonate with, oh, just about everybody. And not just women, but it's certainly some men. But I know this, Crescent, the people that listen to us are aged from 40 to 80. Do you know what I mean? And this is one of those topics uh, that resonates with every age group, I think, in women. Now, here's the story. I'm at IACP, and people know I always speak about IACP because I was a member for 25 years, International Association of Culinary Professionals. And there, so we go to, and they would, it, it, they've changed, but the format used to be that we would go to have coffee in the morning in some gigantic ballroom and there's some coffee urns and some little pastries and people could network and you were in front of me okay and I had I think I I don't know if I'd been in one of your um seminars yet but I knew of you from your books if people don't know I Crescent is a cookbook author she's a writer she's just so many things. She's a mentor. She teaches fearless writing courses. She's had a very successful career. I, a mentor to me from Crescent, just knowing you. So you're in front of me and your clothes are colorful and you've got your jewelry on and you're very put together. You always are. And I was standing right behind you and there was a tiny little hole on the crown of your head of your hair. You just like the brush had missed it. Your hair, you look beautiful. And of course, because I'm a food salesman, I had to pull on it to change, to cover the hole. And, and I, I, probably, you. <laughs> I probably started to do it before I said anything. And, I'm sure. and then you turned around with the dear smile. I said, I'm so sorry. There was a teeny little hole in your perfect hair and I wanted to fix it. And you said, how nice of you. Thank you. I'm <laughs> And then I said, I'm Denise Favaldo. And we started talking. As I walked away from that encounter, I remember thinking, you know, Denise, you're not always thinking before you touch people, <laughs> comment on something. But it's just that you were so put together. And I, being a woman of a certain age, I know once in a while when people take pictures of me, Crescent, if I was on a set or Cindy and I were somewhere and I thought I looked so great. And then I see that I had this little tiny hole in the back of my head. The person that tells you you have spinach on your tooth is your friend. <laughs> you know, follow them home, make them part of your life. The person that will tell you that is your buddy. <laughs> your buddy. So Crescent, I have known Crescent for, I don't know, I think 20, 25 years, something like that. At least that. I have sat in her seminars, on her writing seminars, and if anyone has the opportunity, we're going to give you the information on that. Cindy puts everything up so we can, well, so people can stalk you, Crescent, later <laughs> on. But let me tell you, this week, of all the times when we're getting ready for the holidays, Crescent had sent me a link for a video she did called Self-Compassion 101. Now, I'm going to tell you something, madam. I watched it entirely about two weeks ago, and I watched it again yesterday. And the reason why is it's jam-packed with information, and I'm one of those people that needs to, I see, I listen, I touch things, but I need to hear things more than once to, to absorb it. And I thought, why isn't everyone talking about this video? Why, are, why isn't everyone talking about this video? Because... This is, a, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be generalizing. This is such a woman thing, okay, that women don't have self, they have self-compassion for everyone in the world, but not themselves. So I need you to tell us, tell me, how did you know to do this video or what made you do it? Well, okay, I think 
I think we have sort of two paths to travel Please. here. And the first, the first path is some years ago, I began teaching a, a workshop called Fearless Writing. Some years ago, it's like women beyond a certain age. It's like 30 years ago that I started teaching <laughs> Fearless Writing. And you know how people say everything I need to know in life I learned in kindergarten, I learned from my cat, whatever thing they, they fill it in with. Um, kind of almost everything I need to know in life, I learned from writing, such as the fact that, you know, most people that are drawn to something called fearless writing feels they want to write, but they are afraid to. So, um, so fear, they relate to that. And so one of the first things I wind up saying is fearless writing is a lie. Fear is part of the process. You work through it. You just don't let it stop you. And here's how we're going to do that. And over the years, many, many times, people would come up to me after one of those workshops. I used to teach them in person over an intensive weekend, and now I do it in a different way, not only because of Zoom, but because I'm older and I don't want to do an intensive weekend anymore. I'd rather do it over a period of time and let it saturate slowly. And anyway... <laughs> such a gift to your students that we now have the technology for the online oh. because uh, Crescent, I've done many white writing seminars, as you know, but I think spacing it out like you're doing now gives people again, some time to absorb and to do the exercises. I think you're, I think it's so smart. I think it's so it's smart. Just, it's just great. And it means that you can have people from all over the world in one room and, you know, people that are agoraphobic, or that they have, a, have somebody that they're caring for at home, whether it's a young child or an elder parent or a partner who's sick. Um, it's just, I have really, really liked it. But anyway, all these years, people have been saying to me afterwards, you know, it's not just fearless writing, it's fearless living. What you learned, you know, what you said about that, like fear being inherent in the process, so how do you manage to make it your friend? Which is one of the things I say is make, make fear a partner, make fear your friend. Don't run away from it. Look at it. You know, don't listen to the things that it's telling you, but hear that it's there. Don't just try to, anyway, over the years, people kept telling me that. And finally, a woman who I like to mention as a collaborator, her name is Sweetie Berry. And she, she kind of put her foot down. She stalked me for a while. And what she does is she likes to help particularly people who are of a certain age and particularly women um, make the trans transition to digital and to make sure that whatever wisdom they may be a conduit for does not get lost. So she's very into archiving, creating, working with, and all of that stuff. And so Sweetie said to me, yeah, fearless living, fearless writing is great, but you need to think about teaching a series that is in fearless living. And I'm here to help you film them and do them. And we're going to do them because people want them and people need them. And I've been tracking you and I want, meh, meh, meh. you know, she's a little bit bossy as some of my favorite people are. <laughs> bossy gets things done. That's what I think about bossy. I like that. You know, in, intelligent bossiness is yeah. kind of great. Um, you know, you have to know, know when to throw it out if it's imperfect bossiness, but um, which of course all, all everything we do is imperfect as we, we weeble wobble up towards trying to get, to get better and have it more together. Anyway, so one of the first things that we began talking about is how much, how much really self dislike people carry around without being conscious of it. And so I started out doing one called Self Love 101. And she said, we need to redo that one. You know, I, I, that's one that should be an evergreen for you. And I said, you know, I think I want to call it self-compassion because that's a little more, um, it's full spectrum. Whereas self-love, it's easy to say, oh, you know, self-love, a nice hot bath and, you know, show yourself <laughs> Get, uh, eat some chocolate. No, 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 no. Save your legs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's not do a spa day. I mean, we could do a spa day, but let's actually like do some insight. I'm kind of an insight junkie. I, I love and hate insight. I mean, it's usually a little painful when you go, whoa, but the high, when you integrate the difficult things that are true about yourself and life, the high, the functionality, the way that you kind of 
fall in love with everything else or much else when you have a nice little stock of of self-love, self-appreciation, self, you know, uh, equipoise maybe. Um, it's, it's just fantastic. So I said, let's start with there. So that's one rabbit hole is um, through writing, to, through fearless writing to fearless living with the aid of Sweetie Berry. By the way, I will always, this is just a little side thing, always give credit in this life. Yes. You no, know, I mean, we, we in IACP and in the food world, we frequently see people who, not to put too fine a point on it, rip off our recipes <laughs> and don't give credit. And, you know, yeah. they're suddenly posted places. And, you know, I've gotten to where I accept that that's going to happen. And if they at least say where it's from, it's okay with me. But one, one day, and, and as you know from listening to that one, I'm digressive. So we'll digress a little bit. I haven't gotten <laughs> the question. We will leap back on it, as they say in the South, like a cat on a June bug. But this little digression is... Um, Crescent, day, I, that's a really big lesson you just said. To get, thank people that help you and to give credit where credit is due is good for your insides. It okay. is. It, it helps is. you to grow up. I, I think it's terribly important. So I, 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 I'm with you. And, you know, there are people that thank you personally in an email for something. And that's lovely. But then you go ahead to read the article and you realize that the first three page, the first three paragraphs came like right out of one of your books. And you go, mm, she really liked that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm well, glad it made such an impact. But I think that if people need to thank each other and give credit. I, I just, it's the way to go. And when you don't, when you're not in that group, you get things like the arguments that we're having on the political front where people say, well, I did it myself. You know, I don't know. I don't need any help. I don't. Well, sorry. Did you pave the road outside your house? Did you, <laughs> did you, did you arrange the garbage pickup route? You know, uh, did you, did you set up a little water wheel in your backyard for the, to, to generate your own electricity? There are some people that do everything, but they're not the ones that are saying, no, you know, I'm, I'm a self-made human being. Nobody yeah. is self-made. We are all, all. I, I mean, my, one of my other theories is that we have two, oh, uh, it's pod, okay. so nobody's seeing this. I'm holding up my hands and I'm saying that life is two-handed. You have one hand to give and one to receive. And it's imbalanced unless you're doing both. But anyway, the on the, on the on the cookbook thing, once I was somewhere far away and I wanted to make one of my own recipes, which was called Choo Choo's Original Dallas Hot Stuff. And I didn't have a copy of the book with me. And I thought, well, I bet somebody's put it online. So I Googled Choo Choo's Original Dallas Hot Stuff. And there it is, sure enough, by that name with the head note that says, my friend Choo Choo and I, da, 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 and it does not credit me. This person doesn't know Choo Choo from, you know, a slice of apple pie. You know? <laughs> I mean, I just was stunned. Not only the recipe, the head note, but that's a digression there. This life is full of those little things that kind of slap you in the face. <laughs> but so it is, you just move on. So the other reason why I did why I leaned towards self-compassion one-on-one is um, I am the world's most outgoing introvert. And I was a very funny little kid, you know, and weird, a weird little kid. And there's a line in one of my books for children. I have written 28 books for children. And one of them is about a bat that gets trapped in a dining room. It's called Bat in the Dining Room. Mm -hmm. And Everybody's freaking out, but there's one little girl who dropped to the floor and hid under the tablecloth and watched the bat circling around and felt for the bat. And she remembered that there's an exit door and she pushed it and the bat flies out. So in the book, it says, strange Melissa at school, they called her weird. And, you know, certainly I was a strange Melissa. You know, I was the one that was thinking about how the bat felt. It, it, uh, uh, metaphorically, I, have, yeah. I let the bat out when I was, you know, forty, not when I was a little girl. But that's how it—that's how it morphed itself into my writing. So, so I spent a lot of time 
I did not have a happy childhood. I did not have a happy adolescence. If someone looked at me in a peculiar way, I would go home and brood about it for a week. And, you know, I was extremely, you know, I was not, I guess in some ways I must've been the person, I probably, when I was very little, I was like this. And then circumstances as they do to all of us kind of, you know, hit that with a meat tenderizer a few times. <laughs> and, um, and so I had to grow back into just being comfortable with myself. And truly, you know, a lot of people, when they think about anything like self-love, self-compassion, self-care, think, oh, well, that's selfish. But actually, the fact is, if you are comfortable with yourself, which is the great gift of all kind, all iterations and colorations of self-love, if you're comfortable with yourself, not only does it make it easier for you going through the world, but it kind of is a gift for everybody else. Because it's like, oh, if she can be herself that way, and I like it, I can be myself. It just puts everybody at ease. You can feel it when someone's at ease with themselves. So well said. And of course, I just, one, I totally agree, Crescent. And the other reason is, we get into these thoughts and not where it's you were talking about a child if if people you know some of us i have a sister who's extreme was extremely shy okay growing up i wasn't shy okay wasn't shy you so, <laughs> i don't really <laughs> people are always so surprised but i'm just saying we were born this way do you know what i mean and my sister who's shy who is gorgeous and tall and is everything and lovely and she's just masterful now with enjoying her life more from accepting that she was just shy. Do you know what I mean? It was a hard, it, and of course, as a shy child, and I just wonder if this, as a shy child, people, my mother would say it every day, oh, she's so shy, oh, she's so shy, oh, she, and it wasn't helping, okay? <laughs> it wasn't helping. Right. right. So, but I know with that said, uh, it all to me it all plays into what you just said understanding yourself and you know what at some point you have to forgive yourself yeah so yeah. that you can be comfortable with who you are if you can't forgive yourself and I mean really forgive yourself um it's tough out there yep I mean most of us have not done those many horrible things that really require serious forgiveness, actually. You know, we're more like convicting ourselves of crimes that we never committed, you know. Um, and we hold, you know, you mentioned before, it's right before the holidays, you know, when people try to, I've, I've heard the phrase fake booking. I am pretty transparent on Facebook, you know. Yes. I have never done that, you know. So, I mean, I will talk about bad things you know, bad times and, you know, bad moods and, and good ones as well. But, you know, people try to, you know, they'll take 15 shots to get the one of the perfect wreath on the door for, and, you know, you're a food stylist, you know, what goes into that to, to getting that thing, but people compare. I mean, I've, I've heard it said, my late father was in AA and he, that was a, and he died sober the last 20 years of his life sober. But one of the things he said was that, we go through life comparing our outsides, uh, our insides to other people's outsides and the other way around. And it is never a fair comparison because we don't know what that beautiful put together human being is feeling inside. And they don't know what we're feeling inside and they may think that we have it together. And when you write, about your feelings on Facebook, good or bad, I learn something. I learn about you. I learn about myself. Do you know what I mean? If people are honest in our communications, we get to learn about them and ourselves. If not, like, I don't really care that you look pretty in that dress because you used a filter. Do you know what I mean? And shaved 20 pounds off yourself or you had, you know, uh, Scavello came back to life and no, let no, Denise, Denise came back and covered my bald spot. <laughs> I'm moving my hair right. <laughs> but you know what? I really, I mean, the imperfect is more interesting in life, I think, as we get, you know, 
And I don't think that's just in is getting older because as a young woman, when I traveled, which was always to, as my mother would say, the toilets of the world. <laughs> she, she, she was a woman that liked to make a point. She got in the conversation and got up. Yep. But I, she'd say, why are you going there? You know, if it was, it didn't matter where it was, India, Thailand, oh, wherever right. I was. Making, I said, mommy, it's interesting to me. It's more interesting than just looking at a postcard of the Eiffel Tower. Right. Okay. So I think what you're saying, a lot of what you say on Facebook too, and in your life, that's why I think you're such a fabulous writer, Chris, because it's really what you're feeling. Thank you. You see, I, what, what, what you're talking about is a word that I use pretty often, transparency. Now, as long as you're opaque to yourself, it's hard to do it. But when you're transparent, and I, I work with a lot of people who, work, who write memoir, um, if you are specific and truthful and transparent enough about yourself, even if someone has had a completely different life experience than yours, transparency means they will see themselves through you. Yes. They will see themselves through you. You are transparent. They'll see you, but they will see themselves through you. They will see the feelings. And it also helps you when you're transparent and you give up trying to come on a certain way that inside you know you're not, you are liberated in the most profound sense because even if people like the thing that you're playing at, even if you do a really good job at it, um, they're not really liking you. And that's not much fun. You want to be liked as the real self, as the real thing, imperfect, messy, um, goofy, um, and beautiful in that, in that goofiness and imperfection. Yes. And so all of those things, and you know, some of my favorite people are real goofballs. You know, I mentioned bossiness as one quality, but you know, my friends that are bossy, I have like half a dozen friends, maybe not that many, three or four friends. And if you, let's say, I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get a new slip cover made for uh, a, a little couch in my writing office. And I knew who to call. I knew three women who were bossy and authoritative. <laughs> and I could say, and, and they know stuff like that. And yes. Who do you know that could do a slip cover for us? <laughs> and of course they knew the people and they knew they're doing, you know, the good price and they knew how much you could negotiate for. And, you know, and it's just, and you can't, you can't edit people, nor can you really edit yourself except by self understanding and insight. It's not exactly editing yourself, but it is, um, it's you, but you with less cringing, you know, it's you with more ease in this world and less doubt if people like you, you know, when you stop caring if I, I've heard it said once that when you're young, you worry about what everybody thinks about you. When you're middle-aged, you stop worrying about what everybody thinks about you. When you're old, you realize nobody was thinking about you that much in the first place. <laughs> Bingo. Now I say this all the time. <laughs> to myself. And here's why. And this is about, really, this is about self-compassion. Okay. So I'm married now 28 years to Kenny. Love him. But a couple of years ago, he said to me one day, we were in Walgreens, <laughs> and he said to me, whispers to me, Jesus, look at that woman. She's got her slippers on. Now, this to him, the A, triple A personality of this attorney, this was a wrong, okay? This was in the wrong column. He was horrified by these, this woman wearing her slippers. Okay, fast forward, COVID comes, we're not going anywhere. I have like all, most women that work in kitchens, I've found the right shoes for me. They're called Vionics. I tell people this, they support. Yeah, they're fabulous. I have them fancy slip-ons, slippers. So I've got my gray, very, very attractive Vionics slippers on. And I look down one day when I'm in Walgreens and I realize I've become the woman wearing her slippers to Walgreens. And I laugh so hard 
because I realized that I felt perfectly comfortable, but also no one was looking at my feet. No one was. Oh. Yeah. And when I got home, I said to Kenny, I said, Kenny, I need to share something else. Another invisible line in our relationship. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. What did he say? Did he? Oh, he laughed. He said, "Oh, uh, uh, oh, yeah, okay." I, 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 and then he kind of because I said, "You know, Kenny, no one cares." I wasn't hurting anyone. I had on slippers because they're so good for my feet. You know that I forget that I have them on. And then he kind of just went, "Oh, okay," <laughs> and that was the end of it. I don't think he had a word to say back because he was so shocked by my exuberance. Yeah. That I Yes. Liberated now by being able to wear slippers to Walgreens. You know, you know, this reminds me of something. I don't exactly have it in the self-compassion tape, but when I talked about how everything I need to know in life I learned from writing, people sometimes say to me, in seriousness, they'll they'll say, Well, you know, I write in my head all the time, and you know, I attempt to accept that, except in my heart of hearts, what I really think is. Sure, everybody writes in their heads all the time. It's called thinking. <laughs> and, and, uh, and human beings have a powerful and profound need for narrative because it's how we figure out everything that happens. And we have the choice of the writing in our heads of which narrative we're gonna tell. And when you told that story, I had this story relating to my sweet husband. I have a late life marriage. I've been married. I have been widowed, not once, but twice. The second time, he, David and I were not married, so some wouldn't say it was widowed, but it was widowed. Well, you were living together for a very long period of time. You yeah. were widowed. And, and then I was. I had a wonderful marriage for 23 years, and my husband went out bicycling and got hit by a car, which is why, you know, when I'm cheerful and upbeat, people can know that I, I had to earn that. You know, I really had to earn that. I've had a... But, you know, you reach a certain age and most people have had brushes with mortality and loss and everything. So how do you deal with it? But anyway, to tell you this story about Mark and I, Mark and I are a late life partnership. And we, we've been together it'll be eight years in February. And um, when maybe three, four years ago, we were... Uh, uh, living in the town we now live in and own a home in. But at that point, a friend of mine was on um, sabbatical in Greece. So we were house sitting their wonderful home for three months mm -hmm. and figuring out, do we like Fayetteville enough to move here? Fayetteville, Arkansas, yeah. um, wonderful city. And uh, early in the morning, I heard somebody with a backhoe, it doesn't bother me, I woke up early. And he woke up and he said, kind of grouchily, "Way to go, person down the street! You couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't wait till seven to start backhoeing." And I said, being the instinctive narrative creator, I said, "Well, oh, and as he said, it is Sunday morning, and they couldn't wait to." And I said, "Well, you know, maybe they've been waiting all week to do that on the because that's the only day that that one of them doesn't work and." You know, they just couldn't wait to do it. And they've been waiting and waiting that they can finally, you know, redig the path for their, you know, and I, and he sort of rolled his eyes at me. And later on that day, he came in and he smiled at me and he said, okay, dragon, got to give it to you, Crescent. I went down the street and there was that person and they had the, they had the U-Haul backhoe and they had just finished he looked so dirty and happy and tired and he was rolling it up the ramp and you were exactly right on that story. Now, I could have been exactly, I wasn't psychic. I just wanted to have in my mind, I didn't want to lie there and resent somebody for running their, their backhoe. So instinctively at this point, I make up a story that, you know, but you see, that is what we do in life. Stuff happens and it's kind of, in a funny way, it's neutral. And then we try to figure out why and what was it? That is why we have a whole, in my view, a infestation of, of um, pundits, right, left and center, all trying to explain what happened. Stuff just does happen. And our interpretation colors 
the life that we're going to lead because of that. That is so, I have to tell you, Cressa, that is exact. I, I feel very much the same way. And when you look back, and this is self compassion, this is again self compassion. And you said a little earlier, I look back on some behavior in my 30s between marriages, I, I, nothing horrible. I mean, God, nothing horrible, but one or two not to be proud of, okay? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe those don't make it to a writing. Just some, I was having fun. Now, so and with, why not? You know, you know exactly. Who does it? If it didn't hurt anybody and it didn't hurt you, and you know, you don't have any tattoos coming out of that night in Manila, you know, or whatever. <laughs> well, okay, let's not talk about the tattoo. But anyway, <laughs> okay. So, but what are you saying? So, but I, in my mind now, 30 years later, 35 years later, I thought of some of those things and thought, Jesus, you know, and, and I'm not too late to beat myself up, but I'm just saying not proud. Now, fast forward. I'm with, I have a big chill weekend every year with girlfriends. We're six of us. We went to junior high together. Mm, We've had three married you know, we've been through each other's divorces. We were bridesmaids and we've had, some of us had kids, some of us didn't. So we know each other. We spend yeah. a, I think of them as my mirrors. I think of them as mirrors. So once in a while when I'll say something and it might just be self-deprecating in um, something, one of them will turn to me and say, what are you talking about? That guy loved you. He would have done, he would have lit his hair on fire for you if it meant that he could be with you. So what, you dumped him or you used him for a night or whatever? Who cared? He was lucky to be in line. Now, (laughs) when they say something like that to me, Crescent, then when I get home, then I write about it because, or I just, but I think to myself, well, they had an entirely different perception of that than I did. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, kind of like people weren't looking at my slippers, maybe I've, I've interpreted something from my past without any, with really not very much compassion for myself. Yes, yes. And I, you, yeah, I mean, that, that guy could still be remembering that. I got a Facebook request from somebody that I think I had one night with 40 years ago. And I've decided not, I've decided not to answer that particular one, but you know, um, uh, uh, in it, he said, you know, I, I knew you back in the, in the old days. He said, I don't think you remember me, but I thought not going there, not going there. You know, yeah, it wasn't that memorable, but you know, I remember it not going there, you know, not <laughs> just. Well, that's because you're also an excellent editor. That's why. That's <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> editing coming out. You. Well, you, know, you, you only have so much time in that's life. That's right. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, I, I've walked down to the corner and I fall in love with the bush that's flowering and the cat that's sitting on somebody's front porch and the way the light is coming down and, 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 and glancing off a window or something. And, you know, so so I know that anybody that I friend on Facebook and their stuff is going to pop up. I'm going to be tempted to write a comment on it and thus be in relationship with them. And I thought, no, I don't really need to rekindle this. I just don't. Right. Now you said something, if I can ask you this, you said you didn't have a real happy childhood. And I think Crescent, this is just is the, and I don't know you that well I've known you for a long time don't you think was that I know both your parents were writers so did you come to writing genetically did you learn did you become a writer because you wanted to work out like you're saying work out some things and from the things you learned because I don't know if people know that you've written 50 books yeah, they're the, they're traditionally published. They aren't the ones where you hit the button yes. and then it's out no, there. No, traditionally published cookbooks. <laughs> and, well, cookbooks, cookbooks, one biography, a book of poetry, two novels, and the rest, kids' books and like children's literature 
if we want to be highfalutin and cookbooks or cookbooks slash memoirs because they're fairly narrative cookbooks? Well, I mean, this is an enormous <laughs> amount of work. This is well, a I liked it, so it didn't feel like work. Good. <laughs> but you know, whenever been... people say, do you have special plans for the weekend? I think, well, they clearly haven't been self-employed for their entire lives, or they would understand there, you know, there's a week, but set periods aren't different from other periods. Absolutely. You, so in your writing, and here's why, and also something in the same vein, when I, you were so sweet and responded, okay, people, I've said this already in the podcast. I had a, a, a newsletter for my business for 35 years. And um, it, we used to have them printed and have to mail them out. That's how long ago yeah. this is. Yep. So now I'm doing the podcast. I don't, I'm not, I had the newsletter to share information to, so people would hire me. That's why I did it. You know, really. Um, and I had things to say, and but I was selling books. I was selling food styling classes. So when the last one I wrote in the headline, this is the last newsletter, you sent me an email back, Crescent, that I printed out. I got an overwhelming response to it. Um, I didn't know if it was because people were glad they, they wouldn't get it any longer, but no. I said to Cindy, Jesus Christ, we should have been putting, this is the last newsletter in the title <laughs> line. Fire. No. But here's what I need you to know, what you said. It gave you a twinge and well-written as ever. Can't believe you did it for 30 freaking years. Good, good work, my dear. Now, one of the things, and then you went on to talk about Retirement. So it made you twinge because of retirement. And you said, should I retire? You were just like saying, people are saying, should I retire? Meaning you yourself. You can't retire, Crescent, yeah. because, and you don't have to, because you're a writer of so many things. I'm retiring from food styling. Do you know right. what I mean? But I'm not retiring from other things. Clearly. So, <laughs> But one of the things that I, I just loved it because it was so, one, it was so nice of you. And two, it made me feel better. It made me feel better it, because you were letting me say this is the last newsletter. Do you know what I mean? Whereas, yeah. uh, and that I'd done a good job. And so we could <laughs> shake hands on that and be done with it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's a lot of compassion. I had to think about it. I kept saying to Cindy, do we need the newsletter anymore? Do you know what I mean? And yep. she would say, ah, and we'd go back and forth. But in reality, it's a, it, again, in self-compassion, I think, oh, well, is it quitting? Am I quitting yes. something? Yes. Am I doing something wrong because I'm quitting? Do you know what I mean? Instead yes. of looking yes. at the picture that it's, it's been successful, it was successful, but now I could take that time and yes. I need to concentrate on what I really want to write. Yes, exactly. So there's the wisest person in my life. Now, I'm going to do this visually because she, we're talking, we're talking um, on, on Zoom and she can see me, but I'll explain it so those of you who are listening can catch it. The wisest person I ever knew once said to me, I'm, I'm at, what I'm doing is I'm tucking a little throw pillow because that was at hand under one arm. And he said, if you try to remove something, it may be difficult. In other words, if you're holding on to it with one arm, but you're trying to pull it away, you're fighting with yourself. And he said, but if you reach for something higher and he lifted his arm up. And for those of you that can't see it, the pillow just dropped to the floor because naturally I wasn't clinging to it. I didn't have to pull it away, it just fell away. And I wish that, well, I'll actually throw in, since, since we're all us here, <laughs> I will throw in a story about something that fell away from me many, many years ago. Um, I used to date, briefly, the musician Taj Mahal. <gasps> For those of you that, that know Taj, Taj oh, and, Taj and I had a thing, and um, brief thing, but affectionate. And um, that's a good and, one. Yeah, that, that is good. good one. And so one day, and I was, uh, I had a little inexpensive room. You could still, 
if you nosed around, you could still find inexpensive hotel rooms in New York City. And I had this hotel that I loved called the Fifth Avenue Hotel. It was on Fifth Avenue, just slightly north of uh, Washington Square. And you could actually get little sort of garret rooms on the top that had, um, you know, slanted ceilings and lovely views. And if you were willing to share a bathroom down the hall, and so I'm in my twenties. And so um, Taj came upstairs to my little room and we smoked dope together. I'm like 19 and um, hung out together. He goes off to do something. And I sit there and I'm looking out at the rooftops from my beautiful view. And I thought this is early self-awareness, early gathering of insight. Because you, you always have information for yourself, from yourself, but you're not. In, and I thought, I don't really feel high. I feel muddy. And I think I'm not going to do this anymore. And I never smoked pot again. It's that simple. That falling away. It wasn't like yanking on the pillow and saying, no, I need to give up smoking pot. on this. It wasn't any of that. It was like, huh, this doesn't make me feel good. I'm not going to do it anymore. And similarly, um, when I was much later than that, in my early early 60s, my mother is in her late 90s. I'm down there much of the time, spending time with her and working with the caregivers and walking her through old age. And of course, you know, this is very stressful. I have a difficult brother. He's stressful. She's running out of money. It's stressful, stressful, stressful. So, you know, late at night, a person can find themselves down in their mother's old kitchen, taking out a thing of premium ice cream and eating the whole pint of it, you know, and one stress eating. And one night at about one in the morning, having finished a pint of, let's say, Ben and Jerry's uh, Coffee Heath Bar Crutch, which mm. I really like as those things go. And I got down to the last and I thought, how do I feel? My nose is a little runny. I don't, and I thought again, all those years after the, the joint with Taj Mahal, I thought all those years in my mother's kitchen, I thought, you know, I don't like the way this feels. I don't think I'm gonna do this again. And I have never eaten a whole pint of ice cream ever again. I've eaten scoops of ice cream. I've eaten half a pint. And actually the last time I had ice cream, it was just a little bit in my head. I'm not even liking the way this feels too much. I might not do this. I didn't make, I didn't get absolute. But so a lot of it is being willing to listen to the information yourself is trying to give you sometimes physically, sometimes emotionally, sometimes psychologically, and then take it from there. And, you know, really the beginning of self-compassion, which by the way, since I pre-recorded it, it's a class. You can go, you can go take it and listen to it as many times as you want. And I, I generally charge on a sliding scale so you can pay as much or little as you want. When you pay a lot, it means it, it doesn't hurt me when somebody else pays a little, and um, which is Perfect. great. What um, a great way to say it. Now, but wait, wait, wait. So, so, so just to say that the whole self-compassion thing begins with knowing what you feel. That simple. That's emotional literacy is like, oh, I have a feeling at any given time, we have lots of feelings that we don't really notice. We think we are those feelings. So we don't step outside of it enough to name it and thus understand it and take it apart a little bit and see, does it serve us? Does it, is it part of how we want to spend what uh, Mary Oliver, the poet calls our one wild and precious life? Do we want to? So it's like that moment of emotional literacy and clarity and true self compassion begins with noticing what you're feeling and naming it and then taking steps beyond that, you know, if you're at peace with it. But as you said, you know, that thing about shame, you know, going back 30 years for something that you did in the, in the delicious foolishness of youth and it took your friends to give it a, frame it differently. But until you know how you are framing it consciously, then um, then it's very easy to get sidetracked by it without even knowing what it is. So I'm yeah. all for self-awareness. Even if your nose is running and you're in your late mother's kitchen, but then she's <laughs> still alive. She was not late. You know, <laughs> eating, eating ice cream and your nose running and you go, oh, wait a minute here. 
you know, and so. I read the process of you taking care of your mother and Crescent, it was inspiring because that was not an easy gig. And I, you know what I mean? You, it was huge. It was huge. It was huge. And to find love and forgiveness for everyone in a situation like that. Now, I have to tell you, and this is why it was inspiring to me. I have a crabby, nasty old aunt, okay? And unfortunately, it's Cindy's laughing. No one can see Cindy's face. Cindy <laughs> knows that I mean, I've gone the gamut with this relationship uh, yes. in my life. And now she's very old and mm. very ill. And for a couple of years, I just wish she'd close her eyes and die. Okay. I can be yeah. perfectly honest about that, Crescent. But I realized that I was damaging myself by even saying it out loud. Okay. Yes. Yep. 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 And I know that as I've watched other people forgive people in their lives in difficult things, that it showed me that I had to do the same thing. Yeah. So I think we just like we learn shameful what we should be ashamed of or, or when people, you know, whether it be parents or coaches or teachers say things, oh, you're stupid. Do you know what I mean? And then we carry so much of this crap around with us. It takes a long time to be able to sort some of it out. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, after for me. After I stopped praying every day <laughs> with the rosary beads at the altar <laughs> and <laughs> incense, that my, oh, did I mention I was in a nun's outfit? No, no, no. <laughs> after, I hope you didn't use one of those scourges yeah, on your back. <laughs> after I'm serious, one day I thought, I'm so tired of hearing myself say this. I'm not going to feel it or say it any longer. And you know what? It, it can't change my relationship with her crescent because she doesn't speak to any, any of us anymore, but it's changed me. Yes. Yes. I feel free. Yes. Yep. And I now I have not, I, I actually, I feel so much compassion for her because I gave myself some compassion to forgive myself. Right. Right. You know, there are people in our lives that we have to divorce. Yes. And I don't, I don't mean, spouses particularly there are people that you have to say enough no and there are some people that you can love or have compassion for much more effectively at a distance because yes. some are actually sort of toxic tar babies you know and i'm like i'm you know i miss i mean i will always have the most positive possible explanation of, you know, I'll, I'll always tell the story about the guy who was so happy about grading his yard that, you know, that he was innocent of waking people up on a Sunday morning. But there are, there are, and uh, those of us that observe the world have seen a lot of toxicity set loose. I guess it was already there, but in the bloodstream of the body politic. And there are people in situations that one has to really divorce from. On the other hand, you know, with the thing of taking care of my mother and, and it was a difficult situation and, you know, we had not gotten along, though I knew that that work had my name on it. There yeah. was nobody else's name on it but mine. I had to do it. And strangely, through doing it, it was the resolution of a lifetime of misunderstanding and conflict. And very strange, and I still, I don't, I still don't quite have this figured out, but um, strangely, I mean, in those last four years, I mothered my mother. Yes. And you wouldn't, you would think, oh, well, you know, that's continuing to draw from the same old account. You know, she always made you responsible for her well-being, blah, blah, blah. But except in the old age, she really needed it. It wasn't crying wolf. She really needed it. And she didn't know she needed it. Yes. You know, um, and somehow in doing that and, you know, helping her, I was helped and it just dissolved. 
you know, she, she, you know, my mother was an amazingly talented woman. She was a children's book writer. She's revered by many in the children's book field. Her name is Charlotte Zolotow. And she wrote books like William's Doll, which was a revolutionary book at the time it came out. Um, and, you know, she had a great understanding about children, not so much about her children and yeah. not so much in the house. As it's a common, it's not an uncommon circumstance. And, you know, she meant, well, she did as well as she could. You could say that about kind of any parent, really. Yes. Yeah. Even, and, um, but, you know, one of the things that I can say about Charlotte is for all those early years, it was never just, I love you. It was always, I love you, but. I love <laughs> you, but if you could. So it was, you know, quite conditional. And in the end, that conditionality just left. She just... Uh, the Sanskrit word is bhakti. She just sort of melted into this, this uh, unconditional love. And she was funny and she was easygoing. And, you know, I always, I always say to people, you know, you don't have to go to India and live in a cave to be here now. Just get old enough. You know, <laughs> the eyesight goes, the sense of time goes, the worries about money go. You know, she had been worried about money her whole life. And she had done very well to save for herself. But she was running out of it. But at the time when rationally she might have been concerned about it, that was gone, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't there for her. So in the end, she was able to give and I was able to give and both of us were able to receive just kind of adoring each other and loving each other. And um, there's, if I tell the story, I will cry, but so what? Um, the, one day she was expressing concern about a very difficult member of my family. And she said, I'm afraid they will hurt you. Oh. And I said, well, you know, you've raised me to be pretty tough and there, there's harder things in life than people that don't get along. Now, it really was very hard and it jeopardized her and a lot of my work was keeping that particular relative from jeopardizing her situation. And, um, and I said, there are worse things. It's, it's not so bad. And I said, in any way, and I said, Charlotte, do you remember how pearls are made? And she said, remind me. Oh. And I thought, I'm going to skip shellfish. I'm going to say, there's a kind of fish. I'm going to skip oysters. I'm going to skip shellfish. I said, there's a kind of fish. And sometimes a grain of sand gets in under its skin and it's not very comfortable for the fish. It's, it's itchy and it's painful. So the fish secretes this, this liquid that encloses the grain of sand and makes it smooth. And it does it layer and layer and layer. And pretty soon it's round and smooth. And so it doesn't have those sharp edges and it doesn't, doesn't hurt the fish anymore. And that is how pearls are made. And my mother at 98, not very many teeth left in her bed that had once been the living room and was now her downstairs bedroom where I had been little and she had been, you know, sight of a lot of things yes. lying there. And she looks at me and she says, clearly, but with great effort, she says, you have made pearls. Oh, Oh, Chris. Now, how many people receive that from their mother, especially after a life of, I love you, but. Yes. You have made pearls. Wow. May now, I be worthy of that. Young lady, we are going to thank you so much for today. I know how busy you've been. Uh, we're going to ask you to come back and talk about fearless writing with us on a separate podcast. Great. I just want to be able to tell people if they're interested in self-compassion 101, do they go to your website for that? Yes, ma'am. I okay. set up a special page for women beyond a certain age. <laughs> um, and that website page is dragonwagon.com slash Denise. Okay. I used your name without permission. <laughs> oh, it's perfectly fine. Um, uh, Crescent, I can't thank you enough for today. There have been, it's, see, this is much like writing that you said. I listen to the podcast with guests. 
sometimes Cindy says to me, you should listen to this one this week. You're going to love it. Or this is a great one. Yeah. Or, you know, or she edits them for a couple of weeks. So I don't hear them right away. But I get to go back and I hear what guests have said, what friends and guests have said, and I learn something every time. And I think to myself, how lucky am I that I, you know, obviously, and also that I'm a genius that I invited you on the show, but besides. The questions that you ask allow people to come out in the general. Well, I mean, everybody is in the closet in one way or another. And yes. good questions allow us to come out of what our personal closet, our personal box of unforgivable and, you know, unacceptable things and to say, ah, here I am. This is me. Well, so I you, can't thank you, you get the genius enough. for that for oh. closet opening. <laughs> I th- can't thank you enough. I have to, of course, thank Miss Cindy, who keeps the train on the tracks. Thank you, Cindy. Does all of that. And truly, truly, Self-Compassion 101, my friend, Crescent Dragon Wagon, and all the information gets put up on the Facebook page and on our website so people can find you. And Crescent, thank you so much for today. This was <laughs> ever you are so yeah. totally welcome. Oh, women beyond uh, a certain age.com. You can look for us. <laughs> Cindy's laughing because, you know, I can, I only have done this maybe 150 times and yet, yet I can still stumble. And if you want to reach us, it's women beyond at iCloud.com. And send us messages. And if you want to get in touch with Crescent, as we said, her information. But honestly, Crescent, oh, just you are a pearl. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Cindy. And we'll talk to you again. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.